I, I don't have too much to say, um, so I'll maybe uh, let Jack uh, jump right into it and, and get started. Have I lost my... Okay, that's the introduction. Yes. Sorry, okay. I, I tend to be fairly brief. <laughs> okay, so I'll have to say a couple of things about myself, right? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Stephanie and Rabbi Gila for the opportunity to do this. I, I taught at the University of Alberta for, I guess, around 40 years or so but I haven't done it for some time since, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do something that's probably still in my blood. Uh, second of all, I should tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, with respect to that, I want to emphasize that on the topic that I'm addressing, I'm an amateur, period, okay? So I stand to be corrected, especially by the rabbi, who has a lot more knowledge in some areas of this topic than I have. And at any time, I welcome questions for clarification. Just to make sure you're asking a question for clarification, why don't you sort of start off with saying, Jack, can you please clarify? And it can't be something like, Jack, I have a very different opinion. Can you clarify why you don't think like I do? <laughs> um, you know, there, there's some technical stuff here and stuff that's going to be strange, really strange to some people. So there may very well be very important questions for clarification. Aside from being an amateur, uh, my background on this topic, I guess Judaica, if you want to call it that, is that I did graduate from Yeshiva High School in Montreal. And I did graduate from Yeshiva University, the Yeshiva department. So I do have background in Talmud and rabbinic literature, uh, but my work at the university was in psychology. Um, so that, that's, but I always considered myself really to be a social scientist, you know? So um, I suppose that relates to this topic. Now, the third thing I want to say in my preliminaries is that I changed the title. You have the title there as being something such as um, comparing the portrayal of women in the Talmud and the Torah, right? That's what you have. Uh, I have some um, second thoughts about the suitability of that topic, but let me hasten to tell you that I will be doing these comparisons. I just didn't want that to be the focus. Why? Because I think it's very academic and I think it's very dull to approach this topic this way. What it does in particular, if I do it that way, is um, that it's not really bringing in the real life problems that contemporary women have because some of these matters that I'm going to be discussing. And it'll help to focus on the real life problems of real women, uh, mostly in Israel, but not entirely, um, if I sort of introduce some different terminology in the title. And the title is now The Sources of Gynophobia and Patriarchy in Traditional Judaism. The Sources of Gynophobia and Patriarchy in Traditional Judaism. Um, let me explain very briefly gynophobia isn't a term you run into very much except in the psychological literature, pathological psychological literature. And from the Greek, it's literally a fear of women. Now, at an extreme, it might manifest as a pathological, irrational fear of women, just as other phobias are irrational. Uh, at a less extreme level, it simply may have to do with having discomfort but women and specifically about their physicality and their sexuality. So you got that? So that's what I mean by gynophobia. Um, patriarchy we're all familiar with. Uh, patriarchy has to do with um, a, um, attitudes and institutions 
that subordinate women to men, plain and simple. That's what patriarchy is all about. So that's my new topic, sources of gynophobia and patriarchy in traditional Judaism. Um, now, I just want to bring in another word that's sometimes used and, and makes uh, a, and is really a very uncomfortable word when we talk, want to talk about these problems that women can have in certain societies and with certain people, and that is misogyny. Uh, I've sort of avoided using the word misogyny because literally it means, uh, you know, having uh, a hatred towards women. And I've read some analysis of the term, of the concept. There's quite a bit of it. In fact, it's the term that's used most often in this kind of literature when social scientists address it. And the problem with misogyny, it refers to emotions and thoughts that are within a person. And we know darn well that it's not easy to ascertain the thoughts and the feelings of people. Yet there are behaviors of the kind that misogyny wants to label that I think are better labeled with terms such as gynophobia and patriarchy. So that's where I'm coming from. Now, uh, let me start off by talking a bit about gynophobia in the way of introduction. Um, there is a book that I listed on the reading list. I don't know if that was distributed or not. It's not a reading list, sorry. It's uh, sort of an outline. Uh, there's a book I have there by Dr. Elena Stokman, an Israeli woman who's been very concerned with uh, the difficulties that women have getting divorced in Israel. And the title of her book is The War on Women in Israel. In that book, in the foreword to it, uh, we find a very clear example of uh, gynophobia. Stokeman tells of an instance where she was on an El Al plane about to depart from the United States after having lectured in the States for two weeks. And the seat next to her was empty. And then some Haredi man, you know, Haredi picture beard, uh, so, uh, long earlocks, uh, black dress, black hat, you can picture it that way, uh, comes to claim the seat next to hers. He puts down his belongings on that seat, but then he starts walking up and down the aisles. And it's obvious to everybody, because he's quite loud, that he wants somebody else to sit next to Stokeman. He is unwilling to sit next to a woman. I think that's gynophobia, quite candidly. Anyway, as uh, this thing evolved on the plane, the guy carried on for so long that the plane was, the takeoff was delayed by half an hour. Stokeman, after sitting there being distressed and actually crying, she says, uh, she decided finally to muster her courage and to get up and say something. And of course, a lot of the other people on the plane were also Haredi people. She said to them, how would you people feel if a bunch of non-Jews got on this plane and declared out loud to you or through their behavior as well that their religion prohibited them from sitting next to, to, uh, to Jews? How would you feel about that? Neil, nobody answered. But in due course, some man from the back of the plane got up and took that seat, allowing this Haredi guy to go to a seat that he was comfortable in and the plane could take off. Clear what gynophobia is? This man had a terrible, terrible discomfort about being next to a woman. Of course, maybe, I don't know if it's necessary to say this, he wouldn't have this comfort, this discomfort of being next to his wife at the time when she's not menstruating, okay? But otherwise, other women that would be his reaction, nor to his minor daughters. He wouldn't have that problem with minor daughters either. Uh, now with respect to patriarchy, which once again, uh, the way I'm understanding it here is it has to do with attitudes, attitudes and people. It has to do with institutions that clearly subordinate women to men. Now, one of these institutions that I'm going to talk about in this talk is divorce through rabbinic courts in Israel. Uh, it is an institution, and the way it carries on 
definitely puts women in a very, very bad position. And it definitely gives tremendous power to the men and will become clear why that is the case. Uh, there is a book that I've listed on that. I don't know Sorry. if it was sent to you or not, but there's a book that was listed there. It's called Marriage and Divorce in the Jewish State, Israel Civil War. Uh, this is written by Susan Weiss, <coughs> Nettie Gross. One of them is a lawyer who's engaged very, very much in helping largely religious women. She's a religious woman, largely religious woman to secure these difficult to obtain divorces in rabbinic courts. And the other woman is a journalist. And now, in that book, amongst other things, uh, you find some very heart-rending cases of women seeking a get a divorce in a rabbinic court in Israel who are very much adrift, sometimes for two years, three years, sometimes for more than that, sometimes for 10 years, unable to obtain their get, and meanwhile, their lives are being held up. Uh, I want to just take one case from that book, which you can all look up. I'm just taking out some of the details, but it'll give you the sense of the distress and, 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 and the problems this woman by the name of Nava had in trying to get a divorce from her, her husband, Avner. Um, Jack, but, excuse me, can I just yeah. ask, ask something? So I just wanted to let people know that I put the list in the chat and people can download the, the text that you sent us from the chat and uh, read it at their convenience. And also I wanted to ask, if, is it okay if I stop the screen sharing so people can see you clearly till you need the, till you need the screen? Whatever you feel like. Yeah, okay, so. I, I, I'm comfortable. Okay, this way I think it'll be easier for people to see you. So, okay. So that. The vaca <laughs> uh, What should I do here to, uh, to do what you want me to do? Um, I, I did it, that's it, it's done. The deed is okay, so I'm okay and I, it's easier to see me now, is that right? Yes. Okay, I still <laughs> see myself in a little box. Next yeah, yeah we're, we're seeing each other in little boxes, but we can see boxes okay, now. Okay, good. Yeah, good, we're good. good. Okay, so let's take a look at this case of Nava, Nava and, um, and Avner, her husband, and just summarize some of the key events in what ended up being a 35-year marriage, believe it or not. Uh, Nava reports that she felt terrorized by Avner for 22 years of her marriage. What happened after 22 years is she finally got him out of the house for extended periods of time. During those years, those first 22 years, she asked Avner for a get repeatedly, but he adamantly, just adamantly refused. And she knew that there was no point in proceeding to the rabbinic court because as long as he won't give it, she can't get it. Those are the rules of the rabbinic court. He has to give a get of his own free will. Coercion won't do the trick, so there's no point proceeding. In any event, after every episode where Avner lost his temper or even struck her or struck children, he, during those 22 years, he would apologize profusely and she would settle down and not pursue the matter further. Although in 1999, this is after 22 years of marriage, he struck her and it wasn't the first time he threatened to burn the house down with her and the children in it. So she did what women are advised to do in Israel if they're seeking a divorce. Don't go to the rabbinic court, which you eventually have to get to because the document that you need to get is obtainable only from a rabbinic court. What you have to do as a woman is make sure that before your husband goes to the rabbinic court and opens up the file, a woman has to get to the marriage court, the civil marriage court, and file there claiming child support, um, alim no, alimony doesn't apply in Israel, and um, custody over the children, division of property. She has to file a petition in the civil court for those particular items. Once that's done, according to the laws of Israel, the rabbinic court should not interfere in those matters. But as we're going to see in the case of Nava, that is not the way it played out in Nava's case. Uh, so she returned to the civil court 
And what she did get immediately was a seven day restraining order. At the time this book was written, uh, apparently uh, their restraining orders were limited to seven days. It took very exceptional circumstances to get a longer restraining period. In fact, there's no such thing as a legal period of separation in Israel other than these restraining orders that can be issued by the civil court, um, by the family court. Then she took the next step. She petitioned the rabbinic court for a get, but when Avner adamantly refused a get and the seven day restraining period lapsed, she withdrew all of her court petitions, both in the rabbinic court and the civil court, and Avner came home and they lived in a terrible tug of war for the next two years. In 2001, something happened that for her was beyond the pale. Avner struck their nine-year-old child who fell down the stairs and was very badly hurt. Nafa went back and filed a new petition with the family court. After an investigation, the family court obtained Avner's consent to stay away from home until a settlement was reached. The court had to get his consent because they're limited in how long there's a restraint, restraining order they can issue. But of course, during this period of separation, Avner did not pay child support, which created a problem for her. In 2002, um, she petitioned the rabbinic court for a get, and Avner petitioned that same court for reconciliation. He didn't get the message that this marriage just was not acceptable and was not going to work. Nine months after both of them petitioned the rabbinic court, she offered for divorce and Avner for reconciliation. The rabbis, three rabbis, and by the way, that's important too, these courts require three rabbis to sit, which makes it much more expensive than in a civil court. And of course, there's the possibility of deadlock and whatnot, as we'll see later. In any event, nine months later, the three rabbis turned down Avner's request for reconciliation. They were totally convinced that Nava was so opposed to getting together with this man that there was no point trying to bring a reconciliation about. But however, uh, the rule is in rabbinic courts that just because the rabbis realized reconciliation was impossible, it didn't mean that they were going to issue a divorce either. The two don't go together in rabbinic courts. Uh, so when the rabbis let her know, no, we cannot grant a divorce, he has to grant the divorce to you, Nava and Avner still insisted on that reconciliation. In fact, he told the rabbis that while they were still together, they had sex every morning, to which Nava responded that she didn't want that sex, she rejected it, in fact, she told the rabbis it very definitely was rape. As soon as she told the rabbis that, the rabbis turned against her with great indignation and reprimanded her because according to the Mishnah, the codification of Jewish law, uh, a wife who refuses sex to her husband is a rebellious wife. So they reprimanded her for even suggesting that it was possible that Avner raped her. What happened after that is, uh, is Nava had an outburst in the court and eventually the case ended up being dismissed. In 2004, Nava had a petition to start the case up again, pay money to do that, and a hearing was held, and this time the court issued a decision, but it wasn't the kind of decision that Nava or her lawyer wanted to hear. Uh, the court decided to recommend a get, but not compel Avner to divorce, to, get, to give Nava a divorce. So recommending a get is saying, be a nice boy and give her a get because she really deserves it. But really your free will has to rule here. You do, you do it when you're able to do it. Uh, now what happened in some of the decisions that the three rabbis rendered, uh, well, first of all, they disagreed amongst themselves as to whether what was very clear to all of them, whether emotional abuse or separation, the two were separated for over a year, was sufficient grounds to compel a get in rabbinic law. They, they had a disagreement about that. One rabbi ruled there was no clear reason even for Nava to find Avner repulsive. 
And now the rabbi accepted there was reason for Nava to find Avner repulsive, but quoted an important medieval commentator, the Ramah, uh, by Moses, Moses Easerlish, who ruled that repulsion is not sufficient grounds for compelling a get, merely for recommending a get. In 2005, a year later, the rabbinic court arranged a hearing where Avner said he would not give a get while matters of property and child support were being handled by the family court. Uh, the rabbinic court took cognizance of the property matters, which legally they could not and should not have done. They had no jurisdiction over that matter, was already filed in the civil court. In 2006, Nava countered by suing Avner in civil court for 450,000, the equivalent of $450,000 Canadian, in damages for get refusal. Essentially, she's arguing this has caused me very considerable pain, very considerable distress, very considerable angst, very considerable financial loss, and I want to sue this guy for damages. In 2007, this is another year later, the Repentic Court made it very clear to Nava and her lawyers that as long as the suit for damages for almost half a million dollars was in process, a get could not be issued. They could not compel Avner to give a get because the fact of that suit in itself was coercion for Avner. And God forbid he should be coerced by a suit in the civil court that might encourage him to give a get sooner rather than later. Um, and the court even explained to her lawyer that even if they issued a get under these circumstances where there is a suit for damages in a civil court against the husband that has to give the get uh, freely, that the get would not be valid. Even though the rabbis issued it, it would not be valid because it would be a coerced get and that's totally unacceptable. According to a very important medieval rabbi, Rabbi Tom, Rashi's grandson. And this was accepted as Jewish law. In 211, four years later, Avner finally agreed to give a get willingly, but it required Nava to irrevocably give up all financial claims against him. No child support, no damages, no nothing. And on that condition, he was willing to give the get, get willingly. Quite a horror story, isn't it? Yes. There are many um, other Nava, so basically, Nava's story pretty much shows the fact that most Abrahamic religions, no matter which branch you look at, I'm talking about Judaism, Islam, Christianity, puts most of the power in men, not women. And therefore, whenever women try to go through religious law in terms of trying to get child support, divorce law, whatever, and so again, whereas if they go through secular law, more like civil courts, they, women don't get as screwed over as men do. And that's the problem with the novel you know, the, story. The is, word screwed is a, yeah. good, is a good choice of word. Yeah. And with that is why. The story is she went through secular courts only either through North America or European law, depending on okay. where she was. But, but and remember, it, remember, it been screwed over. remember in Israel, the get document can only be given through a rabbinic court. So women, yeah, no I understand that. Like yeah. she immigrated to Europe, or she was based in Europe or North America, Canada, or U.S. before going through a divorce court. Yeah. She wouldn't have been screwed over, and that's yeah. the problem. That's it, right. In North America, if a Jewish woman wants a divorce, uh, she can get a civil divorce, and if it doesn't matter to her she can do without the get if the husband refuses a get in a rabbinic court. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's the problem is when women try to get divorced through 
is um Jewish or Christian law, she gets screwed over because yeah. men have more power. Yeah, well, this is the patriarchy stuff, right? The woman, there's a tremendous imbalance of power in these rabbinic courts in Israel. And yeah, that's the way it is. Now, I just wanted to take on next some of the reasons why the laws of the rabbinic courts are as they are. Just two very simple reasons. First of all, the rabbinic court, the rabbinic court judges feel they have to be very careful, very meticulous, very zealous in not allowing a coerced divorce to happen, a coerced get to happen. Why? Because if it did happen, it would be invalid. The consequences then would be as follows. If the woman without this, without this legitimate get had another relationship, it would be an adulterous relationship. No rabbi in the future would ever marry her because of that relationship. And to make matters worse, any child that came from that union would be called a mamzer. The problem is, is the adultery is always placed on the women, not the men. Yeah, 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 of course. You're absolutely- okay, Men can be adulterous as just as much as women can be. And that's where it's unfair. You're, a, you're absolutely right. Okay, let me, let me follow up on, on what you brought up here with the Israeli system. If a woman without a proper get has a relationship, she's an adulteress legally in rabbinic law. A consequence is no rabbi will marry her in the future in Israel. The more serious consequence is any child of this union is called a mamzer, which is not the same as a bastard. It's a heck of a lot worse because it means that this poor kid who's totally innocent cannot marry any other Jewish person unless they too have that same status. And this carries on for 10 generations. So this is one reason why the rabbis feel that they are totally the justified. The problem is, is that women are always are blamed for adulterous relationships, even so, though- uh, Miranda, Matt, Miranda, 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 sorry, right. sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, right. Miranda, one second. Let's just let Jack continue his thoughts till the end so we can see the whole process, kind of, okay? Because yeah, I think we all agree clar- with you here. Oh, okay. questions for clarification. Thank you, Gila. <laughs> okay. Uh, So that's one important reason why the rabbis feel they have to, have to be sure that the husband is giving it of his own free will. Second reason is, and and this might be a little hard to believe, but in the Talmud, and we'll see more of the Talmud shortly, there is the legal presumption, it's called a chazakah, which really translates as an axiom, a self-evident truth. Everybody knows this is true. In the Talmud, it is stated by a guy, a rabbi by the name of Rosh Lakish, that a woman would rather be in the most miserable marriage relationship than to be alone. In fact, if you want the um, Aramaic for that, I'll give it to you. Um, it goes something like uh, uh, Tav Metav Armalu. It is far better to live, and Armalu might be translated as alone, or it might be translated in total misery. Me, Lemetav. Sorry, sorry. I, I sort of got that wrong. I mean, let me not try to go back to the Aramaic. I don't have it here, and uh, my memory is not as good as it used to be. But essentially, the, the, the self evident truth is that a woman would rather have the worst husband possible than to be alone. Now, there's a very interesting story here. Um, Way back in the 1950s, a rabbi and uh, political scientist and lawyer, Rabbi Emanuel Rachman, I took a political science course from at Yeshiva University, actually showed up at the Rabbinical Council Assembly annual meeting, and he started to propose how we can reform Jewish marriage laws. And one of the things he said, he said a number of things, but one of the things he proposed to the audience of rabbis there is why should we still accept the truth of this presupposition that a woman would rather put up with anything rather than to be alone? He said, let's think of it as a sociological thing. Back then, it may have been true. 
But nowadays, with women much more self-sufficient, it's obviously no longer true. Anyway, some rabbi who was in that session and heard um, Rachman say this ran off to another session where Rabbi um, Soloveitchik, who was the leader of modern orthodoxy at the time, was speaking, told Soloveitchik what was going on. Soloveitchik came to Rachman's session without being asked. He just took over the microphone and he said, what Rachman's saying is absolutely wrong. This is not a sociological presumption. This is an existential presumption, and it's based in the statement in Genesis that a woman has to cleave to her husband, and he shall rule over her. From this, Soloveitchik interpreted that it's an existential presupposition that holds through all, through all of the ages, no matter how society changes. So this is pretty serious stuff. So I wanted to show you a little bit of that. Now, I want to go on to the next part here, unless you have a question for clarification. I don't want to get away from that. Now, the question for us tonight is, what are the sources of these contemporary problems in Judaism? Uh, the gynophobia, this discomfort, and sometimes this actual phobia with respect to women, and then these patriarchal attitudes and institutions and procedures and practices. What is the source of it? Now, I can answer with respect to the patri patriarchy very easily. The subordination of women in patriarchal society is clearly traceable to the Hebrew Bible. No question about it. It was thoroughgoing patriarchal, but the gynophobia does not originate in the Hebrew Bible, and I'm going to give you some um, data shortly to try to convince you that that's the case. Patriarchy, yeah, but not the gynophobia. Uh, the source of the patriarchy, sorry, the gynophobia, is the Talmud and later traditional rabbinic literature, which still continues to be developed until this day, never ceased. Um, maybe I ought to say a little word to those who haven't encountered this before. Uh, the Talmud consists of two parts. The first part is really not a real codification, but a first attempt at codification of Jewish law which was published in the year 200 of the Common Era, okay? And then the other part of it, the Gemara, issued altogether under the title Talmud, originally was thought to be issued in the year 500, but nowadays this thinking has been revised. Maybe the development of the Talmud carried on until the year 700. So this is second to the Bible, the most authoritative, compedium of Jewish law and Jewish practice. Um, now, let me then come back to the Bible as the source of gynophobia. Now, although women were subordinate to men in biblical times, and you shouldn't think that the Bible is the source of patriarchy, it isn't. Patriarchy was found throughout the ancient world. It was found in Canaan, where the Israelites were. So it would be totally surprising if it wasn't amongst the Israelites as well. Um, but although, here's a remarkable thing, although women were subordinate to men in biblical society, uh, biblical writers, and the biblical writers we're assuming were entirely men, we don't know who wrote the Bible for real. Uh, although one Chabad rabbi once declared, a Chabad rabbi in Montreal declared, the Bible was written by one man, and that man is God. But the truth is, we don't know who wrote the Bible. We're assuming that it was men. Men were literate, women typically were not. Um, now, in spite of the fact that the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and I'm talking about everything from the five books of Moses to the prophets to the writings were written by man. In spite of that, um, we can't find evidence that these men who wrote the Bible wrote about women in such a way that reveals that they were prejudiced against women. Isn't that remarkable? The women were subordinate. They played there that role. There were many women that were quite Sorry. strong and... Obstinate. That's what I'm getting to. I got, I got around. Hold your horses for a little bit. That's exactly where I'm going. 
So, but I think this is rather remarkable, a patriarchic, patriarchic society. And yet the portrayal of women in the Bible don't suggest women who are timid little wusses, quite the contrary. Now let's take a look at this. Or another way of summing this up, I like this way of phrasing it too. Although the women in biblical times were subject to societal, widespread societal discrimination, this discrimination was not based on prejudice against them. And we know that's not the way it usually works. You discriminate against blacks and what precedes it is terrible prejudice against blacks. That's the way the, the order of things are, but not in biblical times. Now, the biblical scholar, you might want to take note of this. I don't have this in uh, what I handed out. Uh, Tikva Frymer Kensky, Tikva Frymer Kensky, makes the striking claim that the Hebrew Bible is actually blind to sexism. That the Hebrew, the writers of the Hebrew Bible, according to her, don't distinguish between men and women except in the obvious ways that women are different, namely they bear children, uh, namely they nurture infants and their males, and uh, namely their sexual partners for women, that otherwise the way women are described, they don't sound any different from men. Um, now, this may not be surprising as it sounds, because I did do some reading after I got into this topic, that in some of the writings on um, misogyny, there's one theorist who makes this claim, which has a lot of plausibility to me, that in a well-functioning patriarchic, patriarchic society, theoretically, there should be very little misogyny because women know their place, the women are pleasing the men, they're feeding them, they're giving them sex, they're taking care of them, they're taking care of the kids, they're earning a living very often. What's not to like? What's to be misogynistic about? So maybe what um, Tikva Frymer Kensky, maybe your observation has to do with the fact that this theory is correct, that in a patriarchal society, you will have very little misogyny. Anyway, let's go on. Now, the Bible gives us many examples of very strong women, and I'm going to very briefly breeze through some of them. So ha hang on, Miranda. You will recognize some of this. Let's start with Sarah, the matriarch Sarah. Um, subordinate to Abraham for sure. But when she had her own child at the age of 99, what's one of the first things she did? She decided that she didn't want Ishmael, right? who she brought into the world because she gave her concubine or handmaiden to Abraham so that Abraham could have a child in her name, right? As soon as she had her own, she said to herself, I don't want my kid to share with Ishmael. And she kicked Ishmael and his mother out of the house. Abraham didn't want to do this. He consulted God and guess what? God upheld Sarah's wish and she was kicked out. Uh, seems to me that's quite a strong woman, in spite of the fact in many ways she had to, you know, play second class. Then we go on to Rebecca. First of all, you might remember the story that Rebecca was in her family home, somewhere in Mesopotamia, I assume, and from Canaan, this guy comes representing Abraham, looking for a wife for Isaac, right? And the servant, Abraham's servant, runs across Rebecca, And for all sorts of reasons, he thinks she just right, she fits the bill. And he then speaks to Eliezer, the servant speaks to her family and says, look, I'd like her to come back to me with Canaan to marry Isaac. His father's a very rich man. Everything's going to be beautiful for her. Now, listen how Rebecca reacted. First of all, the Bible says she was asked by her family whether she wanted to go. My God, what was going on there? It wasn't all subordination. They actually asked her. That's what you do with somebody who deserves respect. And secondly, the moment she was asked, what did she say? I'll go. I will go. Elech. Okay, or however it was said by a woman. And uh, that took tremendous guts to leave her homeland, to go off with this old guy, 
away to distant Canaan, who knows what she's getting herself into, to marry God she never saw. Okay, third one I want to talk about is Tamar, a most remarkable woman. Uh, Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah, of Yehuda, uh, one of the sons of Jacob. Very important person. Now Tamar was married, first of all, to the oldest of Judah's sons, who died childless. Now biblical law is, if a man dies childless, the widow is not free to marry anybody else, but his brother has first dibs on her. And the brother has two choices. The brother can marry her, or he can put her through some obnoxious ceremony which frees her. In any event, the second brother took her, and unfortunately he died as well. Okay, there was a third son. He was very young though. So Judah said to Tamar, hang around here, not gonna free you, but hang around and when the son grows up, you'll be his wife. And you'll bear children for the second son who also unfortunately died childless. Um, as the years passed, it became clear to Tamar that Judah wasn't going to give up this third son because she realized that Judah thought of her as a widow maker and he didn't want to lose his third son as well. So, I mean, Tamar is really, as you put it, screwed, <laughs> right? She's not free to marry anybody else. And this third son isn't marrying her. She's really screwed. So instead of getting depressed though, as a subordinate woman might do, she hatched a plot. She dressed herself up very fancily as a prostitute, uh, hung out outside of Judah's home. He didn't recognize her when he came out. He thought she was a prostitute. He propositioned her. Uh, she said, well, you got to pay me. He said, fine, but I don't have any money. She said, no problem. Just give me some of your possessions, which you'll redeem with the money. So he gave her his rod and some other wonderful things and they had sex and uh, Judah went away and Tamar was pregnant with Judah's child. Now listen to this. When Judah became aware that Tamar was pregnant, and remember, he's the father-in-law, right? And she is not a free woman. She can't have sex with just anybody. She's supposed to marry his third son, even though he's not giving her. So Judah, as the patriarchal head, condemned her to death. He condemns Tamar to death. But Tamar, of course, knew what she was doing. She produced the walking stick and the wallet and said, hey, look, man, this baby in me is yours. And Judah, to his credit, acknowledged that she was right and all was happy. As a matter of fact, she had twins. And here's a beautiful ending to this. One of the twins ended up being an ancestor of King David. So not only did he continue Judah's line, this kid, but actually he was a founder of royalty in Israel. Okay, so that has a very happy ending and this was a very strong woman. Uh, she refused to become a victim. She became a hero and I would suggest. Now, another woman I'll mention very briefly is Achsa. She was the daughter of Kalev, Kalev ben Yefune, Joshua's sidekick in Exodus. Uh, one of the only two who actually survived the 40 years in the desert and came to the promised land. And uh, anyway, he had a daughter and he was a chieftain and there was a war going on. And uh, Caleb said, whichever of my generals wins this battle, I will give him my daughter. I'm not asking her, but he's got my daughter. So the daughter's name was Arsa. And uh, unwillingly, she had to become the wife of this general. And nonetheless, even though she had to obey her father in this matter, a patriarchal society, nonetheless, she had real steely determination. The general, of course, was going to fight battles and she was going to her livelihood, right? And she said, this is not going to happen. She bugged her husband to go to her father to get land which would be a source of support to them. And then, um, and then she herself went to her father and said, I need two sources of water for this land, which he gave her. I think a very strong woman. 
Another woman I'm gonna mention briefly from the writings is Esther. What's so remarkable about Esther? It sounds like she was a bit of a wimp and listened to everything that Mordechai told her to do. Uh, well, the remarkable thing about her record, she has the distinction of being the only woman who decreed the celebration of a Jewish holiday, and she did decreed that in the Gilat Esther, she decreed that it be kept forever, and it was. That is really quite a remarkable achievement for a woman in biblical times. And the biblical authors wrote it up this way that she decreed the holiday. Uh, now I want to get into women um, that I'm going to distinguish from the first ones, in that for each of these women uh, who were very successful, very strong, the Talmud had something to say about them that was really concerning, okay, and at times very uncomplimentary. So this is the beginning of talking about the Talmudic attitude towards women. We'll start off first of all with the five daughters of Slavchan. Uh, there's a story in Exodus of uh, five sisters who lost their father, and because of the inheritance rules at the time, they were not going to get any land. They couldn't get their father's land. They very bravely and with great skill actually approached, approached Moses in a community meeting and they said to Moses, this is really not fair. Our father was a good guy. He didn't sin. And there's really no reason. Their argument was not, give us land. We need land. They said, there's no reason our father's name should be forgotten in Israel. You must pass on his land through us, to us, so that his name can be. Beautiful legal argument. Lots of courage. Remember, the last person who sort of came to Moses, accosted him publicly, and said, we want something, was Korach. And what happened to Korach? He went up in fire <laughs> in a pit in the ground. Okay, so this was very courageous of her. In any event, Moses talked to God, as he was wont to do in those days, and God said to Moses, they're right. Give them the land. But the other tribes raised, or rather, her tribe, her tribe raised hell, the five daughters' tribe raised hell and said, what are you doing? They're going to marry people possibly from other tribes, and our tribe will lose land. So Moses revised his ruling. He said, okay, the sisters can only become placeholders for the title of land, and the land will pass to their children. Okay? In that way, it remains in the family, but they must marry within the tribe. Obviously, this is a tremendously courageous thing. Now, the rabbis got very worried about this particular story. Why? Because it's essentially inviting a woman who's not versed in law, in Torah law, to come up and to make demands of leadership of rabbis. And they didn't like that idea at all. They didn't want any story there in the Bible that's going to embolden ordinary, clueless women to bother rabbis about legal matters. Uh, so what the rabbis did, the rabbis of the Talmud, they couldn't delete the story. It's sacred text after all. And there are many instances of this, probably they would have loved to delete the text. As a matter of fact, there is a case where the rabbis did not delete, but they didn't put in. The rabbis, as we all know, didn't put the book of Maccabees into the Bible because the book of Maccabees doesn't celebrate the miracle of the oil, but it rather celebrates the victory of the Chashmonaim. So it had a very secular emphasis and the rabbis didn't like that, fine, we're not including it into the Bible. Uh, but the rabbis couldn't delete things at will from the Bible. So what they did is through interpretation and where they came by this God alone knows, they said, yes, but we know, how do they know this? I don't know that they could know this because centuries separated the rabbis of the Talmud from the daughters of Tzlafchad. They said, we know that the daughters of Tzlafchad were more than 40. They were very learned and they acted solely for the sake of heaven. It wasn't for selfish reasons, but it was for the sake of heaven to preserve the name of their father in Israel. Therefore, the rabbis ruled, yes, women can raise legal questions only if they're more than 40, very learned, which they can't be because women are not taught the rabbinic laws, and only if they're acting for the sake of heaven. In other words, the rabbis very cleverly made it impossible for this to be used as a precedent for women bugging rabbis. Um, 
The next one I want to get to is Deborah. I don't have to say very much about Deborah. I'll just tell you that I spoke about Deborah a number of years ago. And from what I looked at, I concluded she was the most accomplished of all Jewish women in the Bible, without exception. And I really raised the question to the synagogue audience I spoke to, why are there schools called Beth Rivka? Why are there schools called Beth Zara, Beth Miriam? Why are there no schools called Beth Vora? She was greater than all of them put together. And you're gonna find out why. First of all, she was the most accomplished woman in that she's recognized as a prophet, as a judge. And you know, according to Talmudic law, women shouldn't be judges, but back in biblical days, this apparently was okay. She was the governor of Ephraim, her part of Northern Israel. She was also the commander in chief of the army. If you read the story very carefully in the book of Judges, Judges four, chapter four, five is all poetry, but Judges chapter four, uh, you will find that she is the one who summoned her general in chief, Barak. She summoned him and she said to him, here's what you gotta do, you gotta attack Sistra, you gotta attack him in this particular way, attack his home city, and start the attack now. She directed the action, she planned the strategy. What a remarkable woman. And of course, there was a tremendous victory. And the book of Judges, chapter four, acknowledges that because of what Deborah did, single-handedly, Israel had 40 years of peace at a time when Israel was otherwise very lawless. The period, the 200 year period of Judges was considered to be a very lawless period, but Deborah turned it around for 40 years of her being there. Now, in spite of all these tremendous accomplishments, which are obvious to see if you read chapter four of Judges, uh, the Talmud took a look at Deborah, and what did the Talmud say? Rabbi Nachman, whoever he was, says, Deborah was arrogant. She dared to summon her general Barak rather than going to him. She's a woman after all. She should have gone to him, so she's very arrogant. And what's more, she must also be very hateful because the name Dvora, I don't know if this is true, you can correct this, Gila, uh, according to this was supposed to be a wasp. And that's a very hateful insect. It's a, it's a bee. Really be. Okay, a I don't bee, know. Not a wasp. <laughs> they're nice, nice creatures. They're nice, nice animals, yeah. In any event, the rabbi, this rabbi Nachman made her out to be a terrible, terrible person. Uh, then other rabbis said, look, there's no way she could have been a judge. We know Talmudic law says that women can't be judges because we interpreted um, a sentence in the Torah says, appoint a king. And the rabbis, of course, says, why are they emphasizing appoint a king? Because they want to let you know you appoint a king, but not a queen. In other words, a woman cannot hold that kind of position or the position of judgeship. So you see the thinking of the rabbis, what they did. Another thing they said, which I think is the dirtiest of all, the lowest of all, is uh, in the story in chapter four of Judges, the reference is made to Deborah as being Ashet Lapidim which can be translated as the wife of somebody by the name of Lapidim, which apparently in the Hebrew of the time meant wicks, candle wicks. The rabbis elaborated this beautiful story. How could they know? This is hundreds of years later. They elaborated the beautiful story that her husband, Vora's husband, was a nothing. He had to go around from 10 to 10 selling wicks for Sabbath candles. That's all he was good for. Uh, so they really put her down, didn't they? Uh, suggesting that the rabbis of the Talmud had a great fear of the power of women. And they devised halakha to control women. The last one I'm going to talk about is Hulda. Hulda comes from the um, Book of Kings. She was a prophetess. There was another woman prophetess other than Vora. Um, uh, in the seventh century, according to the Book of Judges, the manuscript was found in the temple that was brought to the attention of the king, King Josiah, at the time. Uh, the king read it, he was moved to tears because he found out from this book, which apparently might have been one of the lost books of Moses, very important stuff. He found it from this book that he'd been violating a lot of laws of Moses. 
what you did tshuva for, and so on and so forth. In any event, Josiah did want to validate the book, that it really was one of the books of Moses. He called on Hulda to do this, Hulda the woman prophetess. He didn't call on Jeremiah, who was her contemporary. I mean, this is extraordinary that the king turned to a woman and not the great famous prophet Jeremiah to validate that this was truly one of the books of Moses. Isn't that remarkable? Doesn't that tell you? They were put down because of the patriarchy, which persisted everywhere, but it didn't go along with prejudice to, um, towards women. What did the Talmud have to say about Hulda? Uh, the Talmud essentially said that it's impossible that the king called on Hulda when Jeremiah was available, and the Talmud concocted this mythology that Jeremiah must have been out of town at the time. So once again, you see the Talmud undermining, undercutting these remarkable women. Now, let me go on and talk about the rabbis and what the Talmud, other things the Talmud has to say about women. I'll be careful about time over here. We know that the rabbis highly valued their own wives. They valued women who were in the roles of wives, mothers, housewives. I mean, this can be seen today. It was rabbis who, after all, decreed that at the Friday night meal, we should uh, recite Eshet Chayel. The husband should get up and, pro and recite Eshet Chayel uh, from Proverbs to his wife. Uh, Eshet Chayel is full of praise. I'll just read you a little bit of it. A woman of valor who can find for her price is far above rubies. They certainly valued their women. And then they go on to say, she doeth good to her husband and no evils all the day of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. They really appreciate the women as long as they accepted their position in the hierarchy. So we can't say that the rabbis were misogynists, quite the contrary. As long as the patriarchy worked, everybody was happy. Now, let's take a look at, uh, and also the Talmud did some other good things for women. I don't want to make it out that everything is negative towards women. For example, there, there was a ritual in the Bible that if a husband suspected his wife of adultery, he could take her to a priest and she would be forced to go through this awful ritual of drinking waters that are described as bitter waters. And what was supposed to happen if she really committed adultery, her belly would burst and she died. And if she didn't, she, was, she survived and he could take her back. A very ghastly thing. The Talmud actually abolished the ceremony. It may be, of course, now that I think about it, it was the first time this thought occurred to me. Of course they abolished it. There was no more temple, no more priests. What could they do? It couldn't still exist. But in any event, we'll give them credit for abolishing the ceremony. Uh, another thing they did, which was very important for women, under biblical law, there was no marriage contract. A man could dismiss his wife by simply saying, you're gone, I divorce you, right? That's all that it took, and she's really gone, and he doesn't owe her a cent. Uh, the Talmud developed some real sensitivity about this and required that for marriage, there had to be a ketubah, a marriage contract which specified that if a husband divorced his wife, he had to pay her certain sums of money. Those sums are still there today and they're very nominal and worthless today, but maybe back in Talmudic times they were worth something and, and in a society where women really found it very difficult to thrive. Now, but in spite of all of these benefits or these ones I've mentioned, uh, the rabbis were really very ambivalent about women other than their wives. And let's look at some portrayals in the Talmud. Some of them are hard to take, quite candidly. A rabbi by the name of Rabbi Yossi uh, was sitting with his beautiful daughter in his backyard, uh, and a neighbor, a man, a, neighboring, a neighbor who was a man, actually made a hole in the fence so he could look at the beautiful daughter. Rabbi Yossi noticed, and he went over and said, what are you doing? And the man said, she's beautiful. I know I can't marry her, but why can't I enjoy looking at her? 
You know what Rabbi Yossi did? Instead of cursing out the man, he turned to his daughter and he said to her, you are a burden to mankind. Return to dust so that man might not sin because of you. Is that gynophobia or not, I ask you? Okay. Uh, here's another one. I won't go through all of these and I'll stop it shortly. There was a very famous rabbi by the name of Rav. He and a colleague of his were walking behind, but as they kept walking faster, they realized what was walking ahead of them was a woman. Rav turns to his colleague and says, stop immediately or you're going to walk into the hellfire. Like if he came across the woman in front of him, he and his colleague would be in hellfire. So the colleague said to him, but Rav, didn't you yourself teach that that did not apply? to pious men, and surely we're a pious man. And Rav said, when I taught that it doesn't apply to pious men, I had only two men of our generation in mind, and we're not included. The dangers of getting close to a woman, the common emphasis. Here's another interesting one. Uh, scary, actually. The Talmud in Sachim, this is the tractate that deals with the holiday of Passover, says as follows, if a menstruating woman passes between two men at the beginning of her cycle, one of them will die. Vey, vey, vey. At the end of the cycle, strife will result between them. Then another thing, there's a characterization of women um, in the Talmud in um, Shabbat. This is the tractate on Shabbat. Uh, a menstru uh, sorry, a woman is a pitcher full of filth. Some translate it as a pitcher full of feces, which I guess is the same thing. Leaking blood, yet all run after her. That is misogyny. Very, very clearly. Can't just write it off as gynophobia. Um, Rabbi Isaac, the last one I'm going to bring in, uh, said that when a male is born, peace comes into the world because a male is born fully equipped for life, a female comes with nothing, which interestingly enough is very reminiscent of something Aristotle wrote. Aristotle wrote, and actually believed, I suppose, that a woman is an incompletely formed man. In other words, a woman was really going to be a man, but the birth was premature, so there are things she didn't have, and she comes into the world as a woman. So the Greeks had this nice idea as well, even the great Aristotle. Um, the last thing I will tell you about with respect to the rabbis from the Talmud is that in something that as a kid, I remember my father used to teach it to me on Saturday, the ethics of the fathers, which had a lot of rabbinic maxims. It's part of the Mishnah. It's part of what came up in the year 200 BCE. Uh, sorry, not BCE, CE. Um, there is a saying in there, which I always, always remembered, altar be sicha ima isha. Don't increase the amount of time or the amount of talk that you have with women. Okay? And then it goes on, kol amar be sicha im isha. Anybody who speaks too much with a woman won't study Torah and he's going to go to hell. Now, there's a little commentary on this little sentence here, which says that the rabbi was saying, don't speak a lot to women, meaning his own wife. It goes without saying, called Homer, that you don't talk at all to other women. Okay, that really stuck in my mind since I was a teenager, as I recall. Okay, the next thing I'm going to raise, and then I'm going to stop, is where did the Talmud get its ambivalence towards women? Where does it come from? It's not in the Torah, right? It's not in one of the 613 commandments. When we look at how women in the Torah are described, it doesn't sound like the kind of women that the Talmud is talking about. So where did the rabbis get it from? I'll tell you right off that there are academic historians who think that the rabbis picked it up from Greek culture. Remember, Alexander the Great invaded, I don't know what it was called at the time, Later on, Palestine and Roman times invaded Palestine, controlled it for a couple of hundred years. So they were there. Their culture was there. There were a lot of Hellenizers, uh, not the Maccabees, of course, that fought against them, but there were a lot of Hellenizers who may have bought into 
these Greek ideas about women. And the Greek women, Greek men without question were misogynist, totally misogynist. So some of the things you'll read in an introductory text about ancient Greece is in the Greek home, the woman was upstairs, not downstairs. Downstairs is where the husband conducted business with other men. The woman was not allowed to go out on her own. God forbid somebody's going to rape her or something like that. And most significantly, I don't know how many Greek men this is. I don't think anybody compiled statistics back, statistical studies back then. But uh, many Greek men prefer to have sex with young boys rather than with women. They put up with their women because they needed them to have children. So the Greeks were terrible, terrible misogynists. And there are scholars who are maintaining that some of this rubbed off on the rabbis. I don't quite understand this. Because, I mean, not the rabbis, the rabbis didn't come until later, but at the time the Greeks, you had Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the precursors of the Talmudic rabbis. Now, the Pharisees were most opposed to Greek culture, so I don't know how it percolated through there, but it may have percolated through the laity, and somehow rather it invaded rabbinic circles as well. Um, another theory about how this ambivalence about women gets to the rabbis of the Talmud is that it may have arisen sui generis, it just came of its own. That the rabbis, in elaborating details on the mitzvot of the Torah, took slight hints and gradually elaborated on them and intensified them. That, so for example, whereas in the Torah, you can find hints that women should be modest, right? The rabbis built it up into a whole religion that women should be modest and called it sniut. Women have to dress, they can't have their own hair, cut it off and cover it or have a wig over it, wear long sleeves, don't show anything on your legs below whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it may be that the rabbis in their enthusiasm to please God overinterpreted certain, certain things that were directed by the Torah itself. And I'm just going to end up with this thing over here. This could have very well happened because there's a joke that illustrates this. Uh, you know why we don't eat meat, meat, mix, meat, mix, and milk? If you look at the Bible, you don't know why. But the rabbis of the Talmud figured out from the Bible, I can't figure it out from the Bible, but they did, that you shouldn't eat meat and milk. What does it say in the Bible? It says, thou shalt not sieve a kid in its mother's milk, right? Don't boil a kid in the milk of its mother. And it repeats it twice. So the rabbis asked, why is it there three times? It must be teaching us very fundamentally important about our behavior. And they concluded what it really means is don't eat meat with milk, wait six hours after meat before you eat milk, etc. They elaborated an awful lot of details about separation of milk, meat and milk, which is just not there not even implicitly in the Bible, okay? So maybe this happened with attitudes about women as well. Um, okay, I'm, uh, oh, sorry. I, I was going to uh, sort of form that as a joke. And the joke goes as follows, that uh, God says to Moses, thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. And Moses says, God, what do you mean by that? Do you mean I shouldn't eat meat and milk together? And God says, that's not what I've written. Read it again. So anyway, God wrote it again. And Moses says, oh, it's there again. What do you mean by this? I have to wait six hours after meat before I can eat milk. God said, Moses, look at what I'm writing. And he wrote it again. And this time Moses came up with some other elaboration. Okay. And God finally said to Moses, have it your way. So maybe things happen this way. <laughs> okay. That's what I had to talk about, and now I'm open to whatever you want to talk about. Basically, all your discussion elaborates to me and expands on is the fact that all Abrahamic religions are at some basically level gynophobic or misogynistic. Yes, I understand certain branches of Christianity and Judaism, maybe even Islam, or less misogynistic or xenophobic. But 
it's basically the interpretation of the Torah or even the expanded Quran or Bible, depending on which religion you're looking at, is misogynistic or genophobic. And no, how the translation right. of religion, the ancient Hebrew, has become more misogynistic or genophobic. Yeah, I'm not going to address the other religions, but with respect to Judaism, that's what in effect said. The misogyny, the gynophobia is not found in the Bible. It came about later on as a result of rabbinic, Talmudic rabbinic interpretations of Bible. And it resulted in a set of divorce laws that are clearly patriarchic, that clearly disadvantage women very, very severely. And it resulted in that Haredi men not wanting to sit next to a woman on a plane, and this is not unheard of. It's happened repeatedly. Yeah. Um, I have two thoughts at the moment, at least, Jack. but one of them is um, at the risk of being offensive to say it sounds really naive to me to say that the rabbis picked this up from the surrounding culture and were permeated, that you don't think a bunch of Jewish men, or of, in this case, could have come up with those misogynistic ideas on their own that were going to diffuse the blame and say they picked it up from other cultures. So I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't know if you want to make comment on that. Yeah, well, I, that, that, I, I guess I, I, I wasn't very clear about that. But the two reasons I give, the first one was picked up from the Greeks or vile misogynists. The second one is it originates within the rabbinic culture itself through interpretations and elaborations and intensifications of what they see in the Bible. Yeah, could have happened. Okay, sure. Take, taking responsibility for our, our own men creating a good dose oh, yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Could have happened that way. You know, there's another possibility. The rabbis could have read certain stories, certain items in the Bible, you know, could have said, well, implicit in this story is the following message that women are really not quite the same as we are. Yep. Uh, you could take yep. the story of Eve, of course, Eve, look what she brought into the world, right? Well, maybe Christianity took it out of that story. Uh, there are many other stories in the Bible as well. Uh, what, what's one of the ones that occurs to me? Um, God. Anyway, it doesn't come to me right now. So if it comes, I'll tell you later. No. But you're right. I agree. I, okay. I think... Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the rabbis also used uh, what is written in the Bible that if a woman gives uh, birth to a, a boy, she is uh, contaminated for 33 days, I believe, and if it's a girl, it's 66 days. Yeah, that's twice as much. Twice as much, yeah. That, that is, yeah. Uh, and I think uh, we also should mention the midwives as, as brave women. Shifra and Pua. Yeah. She, uh, yes. And then. And uh, the third thing I, I, I think, uh, Mr. Goldberg, is uh, that in the Haredi culture nowadays, as far as I understand, the, the women are educated in math and English, the men just in Torah. So I think in, 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 uh, in a couple of years from now, the children will ask their mother what is going on. And I think the women might get more um, power, wouldn't it? Because they are... Ed, well, more I, educated. Uh, well, you're right. in, in Israel, I understand that in the Haredi communities, uh, well, I mean, we know that men, young married men studying yeshiva, sometimes into their mid-20s, into their 30s, and meanwhile, their wives are out earning a living. Yes, and the wives may have the secular education or the skills needed to survive in the secular world. Yeah, so things, some are saying things will change there. But with respect to study of Torah, I could bring something in with respect to that. Uh, the rabbis of the Talmud did not want women to study Torah, period. Uh, they wanted them to simply get to know the commandments that apply specifically to them. 
Women should know about making challah. Women should know about lighting candles. Women should know about looking after themselves when they're menstruating and making sure they go to the mikvah properly, right? Those things they should learn, but no other parts of Torah. Uh, when it came to the 20th century, things changed because, you know, the Enlightenment Jewish women were getting educated. A lot of them were leaving the religion. So a very famous rabbi, the Chafetz Chaim, at the beginning of the 20th century, ordained that it's important to teach women Torah more than just their own mitzvot that they themselves have to carry out. But he didn't want that the women be taught Talmud. That's too advanced for them, okay? But in the mid, um, well, mid 20th century, Rabbi Soloveitchik, the leader of modern orthodoxy at the time, said that it's important that women be taught Talmud as well, but this applied just within modern orthodoxy, not Haredi orthodoxy. In Haredi orthodoxy, uh, they're still content to follow the opinion of Rabbi Moses Feinstein, who lived in the United States, that women should be limited in what they study in the way of Torah. Um, there was a second, just small comment I wanted to make, and this is going back to your original story, Jack, about Haredi women and what happens when they get into the courts, the Shonda that you described. And my thought about that is there's a profound irony in that. Because these are women who have been taught, and we've been in Jerusalem, we see the, all these women at the wall, women praying, not ours, who've been taught to be so true to Torah, so honoring to Torah, etc. And then they are not allowed within the canopy of Torah, uh, the way the rabbis teach it, to have a divorce that would allow them the honor to go on living within their community. And that to me strikes me as a shonda and a, a profound irony. Okay, it's not just Haredi women, remember. In fact, there is, a, in one of these books I read <laughs> by Israeli women on divorce, uh, there's a line, there's somewhere that in Israel, women can become jet pilots, but they can't get a divorce in the rabbinic court. This applies to all women in Israel. And, and the rabbis are, the rabbinic courts in Israel are, the divorce courts are always trying to extend their jurisdiction. Uh, there's a famous case in Israel where there were two citizens and residents of Monaco who were in Israel. And they were having a tough time maritally. And the woman decided to go to the rabbinic court in Israel to seek a divorce, even though neither of them were citizens of Israel or real residents of Israel. And guess what? the rabbinic court undertook the case. They wanted to extend their jurisdiction even to Jewish women who weren't citizens of Israel, but happened to be in Israel at the time that they, yeah, oh yeah, the, the rabbis, a lot of problems. So in fact, there are terrible battles between the family courts, the civil family courts and the rabbinic divorce courts. The family courts once once somebody files with the family court, the family court is supposed to have jurisdiction over ancillary matters, over everything except the gift. But the rabbis are trying to horn in on that, and it happened with Nava. Yeah. So can I just clarify? Under all circumstances, the rabbinic courts are the ones to grant the gift? In Israel. Or not? Uh, I didn't think in Israel. In Israel? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the so, only, there, wait a minute. There, all I have Jewish to, women. I have to, very, I, yes, but I have to be careful here because in Israel, as I've been reading, um, it's becoming more and more the thing to do for secular women to just um, cohabit with men without marriage of any kind, okay? Those <laughs> people will not have to get a divorce from the rabbinic court. In those cases, the rabbinic courts have ruled uh, that these women were never really married to start with, so therefore a divorce is not necessary. Anyway, there, there are a lot of ins and outs with respect to these laws. 
But yeah, the, the rabbis in Israel consider they have jurisdiction over all Jewish women in Israel. Oh, Mr. Last, they're cohabiting. I just want to clarify what this, uh, so all um, um, matters of personal status in Israel, and this continues from the time of the Ottoman Empire and the mandate, and the British mandate, all matters of uh, personal status have to be, um, have to go through the, um, the religious court that you of of the um, of the group that you belong to. So all Jews have to go through the rabbinic courts. All Muslims have to go through the Muslim courts, and all Christians have to go through a Christian court. And then, if you don't belong to any group, then you have a problem getting married. Well, you can't legal. And you can't also have intermarriage in a legal sense unless you go to a different country and do that, because there's no court that can organize that marriage or divorce. Yeah, there's no civil marriage in Israel, period. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I do, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing is now, um, at least in, with the Jewish courts, there's, for the last decade, a bit more than a decade, there's been a group of, um, so these are uh, Orthodox women, they have to be married, and they have been going through, specific studies where they are allowed to represent these women in court. So they're granted, uh, it's not a smicha, but it's a sort of, um, they become, uh, they, they, they become sort of lawyers, <laughs> lawyers yeah, in a religious they're court. Called, they're called pleaders. Pleaders, okay, so ta'anot, yeah, ta'anot and they, and they are uh, accepted by the courts, so they can come yes. and help these women. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. There's an interesting case in one of these books that I've read of an Israeli couple that decided to cohabit. They were very content living together and they didn't want any kind of ceremony whatsoever. However, the relatives, aunts and parents started to bug them, give us the pleasure of being at a wedding that you're going to have. So they went to a reform rabbi in Israel and they wanted the reform rabbi to marry them. They could handle that kind of wedding. Now you should be aware the reform wedding has zero legal status in Israel, okay? But you know something, the ref this, I don't know if this is general, you, you could tell us, uh, Gila, but this reform rabbi said to the couple, before I can put you under a chuppah, I need you to get civilly married. So go to Stripus and get civilly married, which they did. Okay, so they had both a civil marriage in Cyprus and a reform marriage in Israel. Then at some point, they wanted to separate. They wanted to get away from each other. And somebody said to them, uh, said to her, you know, you really need to dissolve this, this relationship properly because you do have a civil marriage. Okay, so she went to the rabbinic court and the rabbinic court claimed jurisdiction over her, not because of the reform marriage in Israel, but because of the civil marriage in Cyprus. So really the best thing for a woman to do, she doesn't want to get tangled up with the rabbinic courts, is essentially to cohabit. Don't have a civil ceremony. The rabbis might get a hold of you. They will get a hold of you. If yeah. it's legally binding, you have to go through them to divorce. Yeah. Anyway, don't end up thinking the Talmud is a bad thing. It's really not. It's a remarkably brilliant book. And it's the foundation of, uh, of Judaism, really. Uh, you know, it's been what, Ju and it's what Judaism is in the Orthodox world, in the conservative world. And, um, you know, it's at the core. But there's stuff in it that is very problematic because of its origins. And that can't be changed easily. Can I just bring one story from the Talmud that refers exactly to what you were talking to the to your idea about um, wh what you recounted on Altar Besichai Maisha? Don't have too much conversation with women. There's a beautiful story in the Talmud of Bruria. So Bruria was the wife of Rabbi Meir, and she was one of the only women in Talmud who were considered to be. She would have been a rabbi if she wasn't a woman. Okay, they really appreciated her opinion. They she's a great Talmudat Chachamim. 
And there's a story of Boya who's sitting on the road somewhere one day and one of the rabbis goes by and he asks her on, in which direction should I take, go to get to Lod, to a city called Lod. And Boya answers him, don't you remember you're not supposed to have lengthy conversations with a woman? You should have asked me which way to Lod. And so it's a kind of, so I think that, I don't know if she was poking fun at them or reprimand, reprimanding them for their, um, but Talmud recounts the, uh, yeah, that. So that's a, that's she a was kind probably of, very, very angry with them because sure although she, she was more learned than many of them, uh -huh. they of course did not include her in any of their classes or discussions. But as was their custom, they brought her opinion. And you know, she had a very unhappy ending. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the question. So there's research on that. Um, because what we're not sure about if the unhappy ending is actually something that happened, or is it Rashi's, um, Rashi's idea, like a medieval commentary idea, which was even, you know. Yeah, how yeah. Rashi in the 11th century knew that's what happened back then, I don't know. But I that's think that's uh, Rashi imagining things. But Rashi's then. story is that her husband, who was the very famous Rabbi Meir, that um, Rabbi Meir, maybe because he was annoyed with her, I don't, I don't know, it doesn't say why in this account, uh, he actually convinced one of his students to try to seduce his wife, Gloria, and the student proceeded to do it and she gave in. As a result of that, the story is she killed herself. Uh, so she's really held out, based on that story, she's really held out as the problems of teaching women Torah. <laughs> it's dangerous. Look what we're doing to religion now. I'm serious. I think, Bemet, uh, I'm really serious. I mean, <laughs> once, once you allow and I learned that from uh, Tova Hartman, from my professor at Hebrew University, Tova Hartman, who is the daughter of Alava Shalom, Rabbi Hartman. And she said the only people who really understand what feminism is doing to Judaism, and she was, she's, she was, she's a feminist, and she's like a brilliant, you know, very interesting uh, scholar, are the Haredi people. They understand how deeply radical this, the change is gonna be. And uh, yeah. We're getting there slowly, <laughs> but yes. Thank okay. you very much. I don't know if maybe people have more questions, more thoughts. This was really interesting. Robert, yeah. Hi. Um, so a, a number of years ago, uh, Harold Bloom uh, popularized the idea in the book of Jay that some of the, some of the Torah might have been written by women and it's based on the, the observation, which is true, that many of the women in these stories are much smarter than the men around them. Um, and the men, by comparison, are dumber than a sack of hammers. <laughs> and, uh, I was wondering if you or Gila know if there's any modern scholarship that sort of followed in that speculation, or is, is that sort of um, a, a discredited idea. Remember, I'm an amateur in these matters. I don't know. Gila? Okay. I was just reading comments here in the chat. I don't know. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm just a rabbi. So what I do recommend is, um, so uh, Jack mentioned uh, Tikva Frimer Kensky. She, she, I have one of her books if people want to, to look at it. Um, there's a lot of biblical scholarship and it depends also who you ask. I mean, if you go to, to f feminist commentary, um, I think there will be people who will say, and I've seen, you know, about the Book of Ruth and maybe some of... Uh, um, Maybe Shayao, I'm not sure exactly. There are a few books that are thought of to be perhaps written by women. Um, but even if they were not written by women, the, and, and I, I really appreciate the distinction you made here, Jack, with, with the things you brought between a patriarchal society and a gynophobic society or a misogynist society. And it's not the same thing always. And, I think even if women can be seen as um, 
subordinate to men, it doesn't automatically make, and I, it, we can see it in Torah, we can see it in the Torah, that even if we don't appreciate the, the structure, the women there are still, people, people can still portray them or see them as full humans, rather than this idea that women are less than men and less than human. Um, so I don't know if it only sits on the gender of the person who wrote the text. But it would be interesting to find, I mean, maybe Peter Sabo knows. Maybe. He's a biblical, he's a, he's a biblical Do you speak to Ehud Ben-Svi ever? We could speak with him. It would be interesting to speak with him, yeah. He's a great scholar of Bible. Can, maybe we can reach out to him and ask him. But the truth is, nobody knows who wrote the Bible, do they? Exactly, exactly. which is why, yeah. And I don't think we will know. And I'm not always even sure it matters. Uh, you know, a misogynistic text could be written by a woman. Oh, yeah. Women sure. can hate themselves. Men can hate themselves. So women I'm not sure it's... Them. Women can buy into it, sure. Yeah, uh, I think Bluma wanted to yeah. mention I, I just want to say that I'm really happy that... Um, we have streams of Judaism that uh, go against some of these teachings. We have uh, conservative reform, reconstructionist, Jewish renewal, where women are acknowledged for their intelligence and their abilities. And um, I think we should be happy that Judaism has moved in that direction. Those in Israel. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I said what I wanted to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I said it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just pleased that we, that we have these streams of Judaism. We don't have to be bogged down by uh, some of the things that you mentioned, the uh, Talmudic rabbis were, were teaching. We're, we've, we've moved, we moved in, a, in a, another direction, and that's, and that's just wonderful. And it, 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 enriches, it enriches Judaism to have women involved in an equal way. Uh, I want to add that that's true, but not in Israel, and that's sad, because in Israel, uh, Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism don't have any legal status. Well, there, there are groups that are working to uh, encourage an attitude of pluralism in Israel, and perhaps in the years to come, uh, they will be successful. Unfortunately, those groups don't have the uh, political power. Not, not yet. Oh, most is right. Well, we heard from uh, Daniel Hartman a number of times about this problem, but Israeli, the attitudes even of secular Israelis towards Orthodox domination of the public religious sphere in Israel for Jews. And uh, what Daniil is pointing out uh, from sociological data that he had access to is that even secular Jews, very many of them, if not most of them, are supportive of this Orthodox monopoly because they don't have very much to do with Judaism. So you go to synagogue twice a year, big deal. Let the rabbis run it, I don't care. Yeah, say what you want to say. Robert? Uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, um, what, one further thought. So um, you uh, were talking about the possibility of uh, uh, if, if the patriarchal order is working smoothly and everybody is in their place, uh, there's, there's really no ah! need for Nail. misogyny or, or gynophobia or th that kind of... Uh, conflict. And um, it, it, it reminded me of uh, some reading that I've been doing about settler indigenous relations in Canada, um, where the attitude of white people is, um, they're fine with indigenous people, um, as long as they don't stand up and demand their treaty rights. And uh, as long as they don't show any sort of pride in their own culture, as long as they sort of act like uh, uh, 
you know, in, in a subordinate role to, to the white culture. Um, and under those circumstances, um, uh, there, there's sort of no need for overt expressions of prejudice. Um, but as soon as there's some challenge to the to white privilege, that's when you get this racist backlash. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe something analogous, analogous is going on um, with sexual politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as people know their place, no problem, right? From the point well, of view of those who are running things. People. You know, my daughter, is she on? Jill, are you still here? My daughter uh, spent a year teaching English in Japan. And she told me that one of the things she learned there is that in Japan, they say, if a nail sticks out, you got to beat it down. You got to put it back in. In other words, in Japan, you got to conform. If you don't conform, they're going to make sure you do. Yeah, same thing. Mr. Goldberg, you, you were talking about in Israel, uh, people um, go and live together. They don't marry, they just go and live together. So what is the, if they get children, what is the status of, of these children? Well, ap apparently from what I've read, and, and remember my expertise is not there. Uh, from what I've read, uh, the uh, government has made provisions for allocation of property and all that kind of thing in these kinds of unions. And you know, you can get lawyers to draw up contracts for you specifying what happens if this comes about, if this comes about. So these people, women in those kinds of unions and unions of cohabitation have in a sense more protection uh, than women who are actually married under the chuppah and are under the auspices of the rabbinic courts for divorce. Like for example, one thing I was surprised to read is that there's no such thing as alimony in Israel and maybe Gila can, can kind of explain that. What's I mean, alimony? One, well, once the, <laughs> once the wife gets a gift, the husband holds her nothing further. Whereas here, a uh, former husband, the next husband can be making payments every month for the rest of his life, including sharing half of his pension. Well. That's what I read. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I've never heard of it. I, I've heard the word alimony, but I, I don't, we don't have that concept. Yeah, you have, you, the only thing a, a man has to pay is Mizunot, which is um, money for the upkeep of the children. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. she's a grown-up and he's a grown-up. Why does he need to pay her money? She's nowadays, not a minor. More, nowadays, the women might be earning more than the men. Exactly. So why does he... I'm, yeah, but um, the, the idea of um, common law marriage or common law status is very well accepted in Israel. And there, is, there are organizations and it, you can, you can, you can, there's, a, there's a, a specific procedure you do if you want to be decreed as common law and you receive a card and that's a legal, that's a legal document. So it's not civil marriage, but it is common law marriage. And then you are known as a couple and then that pertains to everything relating to you know, if one of the people die and it's a, rec it's a recognized status. So, so yeah, many people there's... go for that. Are and the children, saying... there's no problem with the children because if the woman is single, then her children are just the children of a single woman. So there's nothing with their status, it's, it's fine. I understand that these couples are referred to as Gedouin but Sibur, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, many people do that. Might be a good idea. Yeah, in Israel. it's it's a well known. It's so much so that up until up until uh, five or six years ago, the reform movement, like your story, um, demanded that any couple that we married had to first go and receive a civil marriage from outside of Israel. But now we don't ask for that anymore. We just need to know that they are Yadu'im Betzibo, that they're common law, and then we married them. So. 
Just, sure. to add, to fly. just a little point of interest. In conservative Judaism, uh, it's still expected that a woman who gets a civil divorce will also get a get. It's expected. But um, conservative Judaism doesn't tie up women with rab in rabbinic courts. Essentially, if a husband doesn't want to um, doesn't want to give the woman a get in his local town, Edmonton, or where have you, uh, the woman can appeal to the central conservative, whatever it's called, court, and they will issue the get over the wishes of the husband. So in conservative, it's not a big problem. But there's something that plays out in an interesting way. I, re I, de I dealt with a uh, piece of response to literature from the reform movement. Uh, you know, Sheila Chuva, a response to literature, uh, where the question was whether a conservative female rabbi should sign the, the, the divorce papers. Whether a female conservative rabbi should sign divorce papers. And believe it or not, there's a prudent opinion that it's better that she doesn't, because if she does, it definitely will not be recognized by an Orthodox rabbi. Conservatives have a concern that the Orthodox are looking over our shoulders. Reform is free, I love it. Up to a point. <laughs> Reform in Israel isn't entirely free. Well, I mean, in terms of, anyway. No, what I'm thinking of is, um, remember, conservative Judaism recognizes the Talmud as being binding, right? Reform Judaism a long time ago stated, well, we should look to the Talmud for some direction, but it binding it is not. That makes a huge difference. So reform isn't saddled with any of this kind of stuff. In fact, I understand, at least what I read in some book I have, that reform does not require a ketuba. However, if it's wish, they can produce some kind of document that they have a name for. Is that right? Not in the, at least not in Canada and Israel, we, we, we have ketubot. Um, what what would you- get. I should have said a get. Oh, for a get? Yeah. In Israel, we've, uh, the reform movement has started uh, offering to do a get. We can't force anyone to come right. to do a get in our court because we don't have any power over anyone. Um, but there, there is gitin. We, we ask people to come and do it if they, we have a bedin for get, but we can't force anyone. There's no, nobody will go and catch them. <laughs> so it's right. kind of, yeah, hopeful that they would do it. It's my understanding that a, the reform movement, at least in Canada, won't marry a, pre, a divorced woman unless that divorced woman has a get. Uh, from a reform organization. Yeah, the same with the reform movement in Israel. Like we were, we're not going into polygamy. Yeah. Or polyandry or whatever. Yeah. Yet. We'll see. Me, yeah. we'll see what will happen in a few years. I guess I could say another th nice thing about the rabbis of the Middle Ages, uh, we all know that polygamy was legal in the biblical times. It wasn't until about, what, the 11th century that Rabbeinu Gershon, uh, who was considered to be a tremendously authoritative rabbi, banned polygamy for Ashkenazim. For a thousand years, and that thousand years is over. I don't know if it was for a thousand years. I think it still applies. And another thing Rabbi Rabbeinu Gershon brought about prior to his decreeing this, um, essentially a, wom a woman's consent was not necessary uh, when the husband wanted to divorce her. He just gave her the get finished, right? But Gershon said, no, no, no. From now on, the woman has to accept the get. And that still applies in Israeli courts. Although there's such an asymmetry, if, um, if a man is married to a Jewish woman and a get is not issued, uh, the man is not considered adulterous if he has unions with other women. 
But a woman who does that is considered adulterous anyway, very complicated. So I just want to answer Leah who asked the question here before we finish about same-sex unions and common law in Israel. So we don't, there's no civil marriage, of course, in Israel, and there's also no legal marriage, same-sex marriage, but the same procedure that common law um, husband and wife or man and woman can go through, the same procedure um, is applicable for same-sex unions. So a same-sex couple who wants to be uh, acknowledged or be common law, go um, to the same sort of organizations, they produce the same sort of card and they are known as a couple. So that's me for tonight. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to answer that. Okay, so, that's it. Um,